Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, or as we commonly call it, APSIA. I'm delighted to welcome you to this monthly webinar of ours called Best Practices in Applying to Graduate School. I'm joined today by my colleague, Kevin Jensen from the Joseph Corbell School at the University of Denver. I'll walk through some high level best practices in applying, and then I'll turn the floor over to Kevin so that he can share some specifics about the Corbell School program. And then after that, we'll have a chance to answer any of your questions that you may have. As mentioned, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in that chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And we'll take all of them at the end, unless it's something immediately pressing or, or technical related. And then also after this, the recording will be posted to APSIA's YouTube page, and I'll be happy to share the slides afterwards. So we'll jump right in. But again, if you have questions, please put them in that box and we'll go from there. So we typically recommend that students begin the discernment project process for graduate school about 12 months before they want to apply. Now, we know that a lot of deadlines are upcoming. So if you are thinking about applying this fall, please don't freak out. It's perfectly understandable to, to begin this process whenever you feel you're ready. But we, for those of you who do have the time, suggest you give yourself a long lead time to really start to do the discernment that makes sense for you. So the first question, of course, to begin with is, what program does it make sense for you to pursue? And this is really gonna involve some research, some digging, some personal discernment, and starting to figure out what kinds of things make the most sense for your goals. And in a minute, I'll give you five questions that you can ask yourself to really start that reflection process. But this far out, you also have a little bit of work to do in that we encourage you to create a spreadsheet or an app on your phone or a Google Doc. However it is that you keep track of information, start it now so that you can be sure to have all of the pieces end up in all of the right places when the crunch time for deadlines come. So the sooner you can start that tracking, the better. And similarly, the sooner you can start thinking about the financial component as well as the application component, the better you'll be able to position yourself. The two have to happen simultaneously. We see a lot of students get into trouble where they spend a lot of time on the application and then only after that go, hmm, how am I exactly gonna pay for this? So we really encourage you to do both simultaneously from the very beginning. So as you're trying to figure out between all of the different kinds of programs and all the different names of programs that are out there, here are five things you can ask yourself to try to sift through all the information that you're gonna see. The first one, of course, is what do you want to study? And that's not related in any way to what the name of the degree is, because in many ways, the name doesn't necessarily evoke what the program actually looks like. So start to look at the structure of the program. How flexible is it? How prescriptive is it? What are the core courses that you have to take? And what are the electives that you get to take? And as you do that, you're gonna start to see whether you can bring together lots of different interests or you can delve deeply into a particular subject and you'll be able to start to compare programs based on how the programs themselves are structured. And again, it's got nothing to do with what the degree is actually called. Also at this point, it's, it's good to look at the admissions criteria and where you are relative to this average imaginary student that comes forward and how qualified you are relative to that imaginary student. There's no number who's gonna get you in to a graduate school and there's not necessarily a number that's gonna keep you out of a graduate school. But as you discern between programs, seeing how closely you resemble that average student, whether a particular school is a bit of a stretch, whether a particular school really has you looking like their average student or whether you're actually more competitive than an average student is again going to help you discern between all of these different programs and figure out where you should apply. There's also a lot of external factors that aren't necessarily related to the program. Do you want to live in that particular place or be in that particular environment for two years of your life? For those of you who love a big city, as wonderful as my colleagues in College Station, Texas are, that may not be the right fit for you. And likewise, if you love a place like College Station, my colleagues in DC or Tokyo or Paris or New York may not be the right fit for you. So don't forget to take into account all of those other external factors. They're gonna be a part of your success and your happiness as you look at those two years or however long of your life in a program. As I mentioned from the beginning, understanding your financial situation 
and asking yourself, can I afford this program? And we're gonna look at lots of different ways to pay for graduate school, but it's important to know your own comfort level with debt and your own obligations that you're taking on as you begin this discernment process and making sure you build that into your thinking from the very beginning. But again, I, I think the most important question on this list is the last one. What is the professional fit? What are you hoping to master with this particular program? And if you're not sure how to go about that, one semi-easy way to do that is to start to read job descriptions for things you are totally unqualified for to, right now. But as you do that, you're gonna start to see some common skills, some common things that you are gonna need to be competitive for those positions going forward. And as you do that, you'll start to build a checklist of things that you're gonna need from a graduate program or from the next several years of professional experience in order to qualify for those positions. And once you have that, you can use that checklist to measure a particular program. If all of the jobs you're reading require really heavy quantitative skills or really in-depth language skills or on the ground experience, you can start to look for those things in a program and see how different programs measure up. So it gives you, again, a ruler against which to measure all these programs, all of their marketing brochures and all of the conversations you might have with my colleagues in admissions. So once you've cast that really wide net <clears throat> at about eight to nine months, we encourage you to start to focus on the programs that makes the most sense for you. And this is when it starts to make sense to build relationships with schools. Seek out the admissions counselors, go to events where they are, go to visit days if you can, open houses, online office hours. Start to really try to build a relationship with a school and get your personal questions answered. One question that we encourage you to ask is whether you can come to understand the priorities of the admissions committee. Unfortunately, Kevin and his colleagues are not going to tell you, well, if you write this, then immediately you get in. Huzzah. It doesn't work like that. But they can tell you a little bit about the kind of student they're looking for, how the process works, and really the kinds of things that help a candidate stand out in a good way. And as they describe that person to you, and as they describe those priorities to you, it'll tell you two things. First, the sorts of things you want to draw out in your application materials and what you want to highlight as you put yourself forward. But also, if they describe the kind of kid that really thrives at their school and you hate that kid, it can really also help with the discernment process because a program that you thought was a good fit for you may not actually be the right place after all. So those kinds of relationships will really give you a feel far beyond a website or a Barker game brochure that'll tell you a lot more about the school. And then once you've finalized your list of programs that you want to apply to, start to think about where your application might be the weakest and work on those weaknesses. Maybe it's a course requirement, maybe it's a language or a quantitative skill that you're supposed to have in order to be admitted. And make sure that you chip away at those things so that when it comes time to turn the application in, you've already addressed them. If you have to take any standardized tests, and we can talk about them if you want, now is also a good time so that you have some leeway if you need to take them again. We also encourage you at this point to start to gather the materials for each school and mark it on that spreadsheet that you created so that you can chip away at all of the pieces that are gonna be due. And when it comes time to turn the applications in, you've already done a lot of advance work and you're moving along quite steadily. And again, you need to keep working on your financial planning piece and apply to any outside scholarships or any of those pieces as well. So this three to six months period is when things really start to come into focus and you start to create applications and materials and, and pieces that are gonna make the most sense for the schools you're most interested in. So what kinds of things do schools typically ask for? Every school is going to be different. There's a reason it's bold and underlined in here, underlined on the slide. So please, 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 please read what they ask you to do. But on the whole, the kinds of things that schools ask for are an application form and an application fee, a CV or a resume. They are different things. Please do what they've asked. Transcripts from every institution you've attended. If you studied abroad, for example, and directly enrolled in a university, you're going to need to get those transcripts from that university. So that's also something that's easy to knock out this early. You might need standardized tests, whether it's the GRE or the GMAT or the LSAT, whatever it is. You're going to need a personal statement and or some topical essays, and we'll talk about those in a minute. 
you're going to need some letters of recommendation and schools will tell you whether they want a mix of academic and professional letters of rec if they just want letters of rec from people who know you well and we can talk about if you like some best practices in putting together those letters of recommendation but starting to think about who can really talk specifically about you what you've done and what your interests are is a really good idea this far out so that you give your recommenders a nice long lead time as well you may need bank statements for financial aid particularly if you were enrolling in an institution outside of your home country that might be a critical component of the application as well <clears throat> so how can you put together a quality essay or personal statement i must admit i personally hate the personal statement component to all of these things but it's really an important tool that admissions officers use to get to know you because really this is the only these components are really the only way they had to get a sense of who you are and what your interests are so tell them tell them a distinct story about you talk about who you were what were your work experiences, your life experiences, all of these different things that happened in your past that contribute right now to who you are, a person who wants theoretically to go to graduate school. So tell me about the person that you are now. Why now? What is it about this program at this particular time that was informed by who you were and is gonna shape who you want to be? And why is that particular graduate program a springboard into this future version of yourself? It's not that you have to have a specific job or a really narrow focus on one kind of thing, but take me on a journey. Tell me this story about these things that happened in the past that shape who you are and how that program is a gateway to the future. And that will also help because only you can tell that story. Kevin and, and all of our colleagues may read truly thousands of applications in the course of a year. And if your application 905 and their eyes are just exhausted, can you tell them something really different and distinct rather than yet another essay that begins with a quote from Gandhi or begins with a quote from Malala, something along those lines. Tell me about you and why it is that you want to be a part of this institution and why that institution should want you to be a part of their school. So really taking me on that journey is, is a great way to say something distinct and to separate yourself from all of the other applications that may come across the desk. <clears throat> so just before the deadline is due, you're gonna need to finalize all of these materials that you've been working on for so long. You need to check in with your recommenders and all of the people who are contributing other pieces to your application. You need to continue with your financial planning and once you are ready, you turn in all of your materials. And it's a good day, but it might be a bit of a scary day. And it's the culmination of these past theoretically 12 months of preparation that you've been doing, of discernment and writing and thinking about what it is that makes sense for you to master. So once you've done that, it's a really good sense of, of moving forward and a great way to make sure that you've thought through all of these pieces and are ready to apply to the, a particular program. To make sure that your application just makes it through the first cross check, we really caution you against making some foolish mistakes. And my hope for you, of course, is that none of these are common things that happen, but just in case. Um, first, of course, is failing to follow directions. If a school asks for three letters of recommendation, send the three that they asked for. Don't send two, don't send five, do what you were asked to do. It may sound ridiculous, but you would be amazed at how many of your colleagues get themselves culled out of the pool because they didn't actually complete the application in the way that the school asked for. Similarly, if you had transcripts from some international institution, make sure that they sent them, make sure your recommenders did what you asked, make sure all of the pieces that you think got turned in, got turned in. And something you may be able to do is ask for extra copies of those external documents to make sure that if something didn't get turned in, you have it and you can plug that hole as fast as possible. We also discourage you from making stupid mistakes. Read your essays, have someone else read your essays, make sure that they're typo free. Make sure that they put forward the version of yourself that you're trying to have the committee see. If you ask your roommate or your partner or a professor to read your essays and describe back to you the person that comes through, 
if that's really the person that you want to shine forward because of what you've seen about how the school talks about themselves and what you like about their program, great. If they describe someone who sounds the exact opposite of the kind of person you want to put forward, you have a problem. So make sure that the essays really come through and really showcase what you're capable of, even on the most basic level, like being typo free. As an important side note to that, make sure the right pieces go in the right places. My colleagues at George Washington University, George Mason University, and Georgetown University, let alone Georgia Tech University, often end up reading each other's essays. So if you write an essay about how badly you want to go to Georgetown and you send it to George Washington, it's pretty much deleted right away because they kind of don't care that you want to go to Georgetown. So make sure the right things go to the schools that you intend them to. And this is, again, why that spreadsheet we talked about in the beginning can be so critical because it will help you make sure that the George Washington essay goes to GW and the Georgetown essay goes to Georgetown, even if it's the same essay, just with all the copies and pastes put in, put in place there. But one of the most critical mistakes that students make, I find, is not really being honest with yourself about what it is you want to master and why. Not only because a particular program is or is not the right fit for you, but also because if there's something in your transcripts or something in your life that has complicated your academic or professional success, my colleagues, you're going to be able to see it. If you had a terrible first couple semesters at school for any one of 100 reasons, they're going to have your transcripts. They'll be able to see what your grades were. But talk about it. Talk about how you overcame that particular challenge. Or if there was a family issue that made it difficult for you to complete your studies, showcase that, that story of resilience, that journey towards something where you were able to improve or overcome a difficult situation. And if you're not sure where the line is between telling a triumphant story of resilience and completely oversharing a personal issue, this is again where having those personal relationships with the schools can be really critical. Because you can ask the school, you know, there's something in my past that complicated my grades or complicated my ability to intern or work. How much of this should I talk about? And the schools will be able to give you a good sense of where that line is between oversharing and telling that good story. So again, getting to know the schools, getting a sense of, of who they are and, and the kinds of things they're looking for can be really important as you put together quality application materials. <clears throat> So after everything's been turned in, sadly your work isn't done. First of all, of course, you have to make sure that everything you think they sent, you think you sent, they received. And most schools at this point have the ability to go online and check and, and understand what parts of your application were, were put in. You also need to thank everyone who wrote you a letter of recommendation. You never know when you're gonna need that relationship or that person again to help you out. You need to keep updating your financial plan. Sadly, your work there isn't done either. And you need to keep learning about the different programs. My hope for all of you, of course, is that you get into all of the programs to which you apply. And so at some point you are gonna need to pick. So the discernment process continues, whether it's with a visit day or again, those online chats or meeting school representatives, continuing the discernment process so that when the time comes, you really know which school it is that's gonna make the most sense for you and be the right fit for you. What are schools looking for is a common question that we get. And as I said earlier, there's no one specific number or one specific trait, but there really is a, a painting of things, a, a mural of things that schools are trying to understand about you when they're looking at an application. The first of course is your aptitude for academic success. It's an educational program. They want to be sure that you are going to thrive in that context and be set up to do well in that educational setting. So your aptitude for study. And similarly, particularly for our programs, the P in APSIA is for professional schools. They want to get a sense of your capacity for professional success. Again, it's not one specific job on one specific day, but it really is about how that master's program is part of a longer professional journey for you and how that makes sense within the context of your professional success. But the other key component here is about your ability to contribute academically and professionally to other people's success. And that's why, again, they wanna see in your personal statement some of your experiences. They wanna see in your letters of recommendation 
how you're going to help elevate everybody else around you on an academic and a professional level. So if you can showcase those things, you can really put together a quality application that will show why you should be in that program and how you're going to help everybody as much as you benefit. So that that's why they ask for so many different points of information to get a sense from you of how all of those pieces can come together and make the program a fit for you and you a fit for the program. We talked a little bit about this and I'm happy to go into more depth when we get to questions later. As a reminder, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in that chat box on the right hand side of your screen. But I wanna emphasize to all of you that there are lots of ways to pay for graduate school. The first three bullet points that you see here are typically internal to a school or a university at large. There might be merit-based aid or need-based aid. There might be research or teaching assistant positions, which are exactly what they sound like, working with a faculty member to do research or to teach. And in all of those cases, it's important to understand what the terms of the funds that are being offered to you are. Is it a loan that you have to repay? Is it a grant that you don't have to repay? If it's a research or a te teaching assistant position, does it come with a certain limit on the number of hours you can work? Does it mean that you can't take any other jobs? Be sure you read the fine print on the funds that are being offered to you from a particular school. It's also useful to sometimes ask whether the central university may have funding for a student like you. Typically on the grad school level, and this is a little different than the undergrad level, funding is housed within the school itself rather than a big pot of money on the university level. But occasionally, the university may also have funds to support graduate students. So since you've spent the last several months building a good relationship with an institution, you can say to them, I would love to come to your school, but for the financial aid package, might there be some extra money for a student like me on the university level? And because you've got this relationship with them, they may be able to go look and come back and say, yeah, you know, a student in a different department turned down a, a grant, and so the university had $5,000 lying around, and we'd like to give it to you. There's no guarantee that will happen, but it never hurts to ask. And because they know you and because they may want you in their program, there may be opportunities to go search within the broader university context for some additional funding. But even outside of the school and the university itself, there are lots and lots of external sources of funding that have nothing to do with going to a bank and borrowing money. So this slide showcases some examples, and I can't stress to you enough that there are lots of examples beyond these, but it really comes down to thinking about yourself in a lot of different ways. Think about what your career goals are. For those of you who might be interested in working for the US State Department or the US Agency for International Development, the US Intel community, there's lots of graduate school funding related to what you want to do once you're finished. So thinking about your career goals and wondering whether there might be graduate school funding for that can be a critical way of paying for graduate school. There's also funding that's tied to things that you might do between your undergraduate and your graduate degree. The Coverdell Fellowship is for Peace Corps volunteers. So for those of you who are US citizens, if you finish your undergrad degree and join the Peace Corps, you may be eligible for graduate school funding because of what happens in those two years in between. Thinking about yourself as a citizen of a particular country. Anyone who's a citizen of a member of the Organization of American States might be able to qualify for graduate school funding from the OAS. So thinking about your country, your citizenship, and where there might be funding in that regard. Thinking about your ethnicity or your race or your background. For anyone who happens to be a Latvian American, there's graduate school funding for that through the Baltic American Foundation. So again, applying all of those different lenses and all of the different hats that you wear to yourself and searching for graduate school funding in that way can be an important way of finding funds that might not be immediately apparent to you or that you might not have known about before. And it can be race and gender and background and the state that you're from and all of those different kinds of things that make up who you are. Also, for those of you who might still be students, there are things that you can do while you're currently a student. The Public Policy and International Affairs Program is a training program for students who are rising juniors that gives an in-depth look at quantitative analysis and economics and writing and is coupled with funding for graduate school. 
So whether it's during your studies, in between bachelor's and master's, after your master's degree, as well as all of those self-definitions, there's lots and lots of ways to pay for graduate school. And the other note that I would put on all of this is, if you're applying to a fellowship program that has particular parameters, let's say for Latvian Americans, please, 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 in your application materials, tell them that that is what you are. Because if you apply to the Baltic American Foundation and never use the phrase, as a Latvian American, they have no way of actually knowing what your background is. So be sure that you celebrate that and you show these programs that you actually fit the criteria that they have. But this, again, is just a very broad look at the many different ways you can pay for graduate school. And on the APSIO website, we have a filterable directory of fellowships and scholarships that you're welcome to check out and see what might make sense for you. So with that, I want to simply invite all of you to start to build those relationships with APSIO schools. If any of you happen to be in Singapore or Korea or Japan, we're on the ground this week starting to get FaceTime for students. For those of you who are not in any of those places, on November 21st, we'll have an online grad school fair, where again, you can start to really get your personal questions answered and build a relationship with schools. And one school in particular that I would encourage you to start to build a relationship with are my colleagues at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And so with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Kevin and he can share more about their program. And again, as we go through, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Kevin, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Carmen. So my name is Kevin Jensen, and I'm a graduate enrollment officer here at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. And I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the Corbell School and the different offerings that, you, that we have. And then I will also be happy to answer any questions that you might have for me um, at the end. So keep those questions in mind, and I'll be happy to get to them. Um, so to start things off here, the Corvell School has oriented itself around what we have identified here as five great issues of the time that our new Dean Fritz Mayer um, has kind of brought to the table for us. So kind of an equitable economy, um, security, human rights, social justice, climate change, and democracy are really the five great issues that Corvell's programs, faculty, and kind of the mission values that Corbell is trying to promote and to develop in working professionals for the field moving forward. So as we move forward and I talk about our programs, really keep in mind that our curriculum is really structured around these five issues, both for our faculty and for the type of skills and research and such that you will be doing at the Corbell School. Our curriculum is uh, comprised of six master's degrees that are um, interdisciplinary in nature, one of the key aspects of our five great issues that we've identified is that the Corbell School doesn't believe that any of those issues can be resolved or worked on unless you're working on all of them together. Um, so they're all interrelatable, our degrees are in a sense, and interdisciplinary. Um, one of the things about our degree programs that you'll notice on the next slide is that they're all very broad based and that's done for a specific reason. Uh, meant to give you a very broad education and understanding of the field that you're going into. But the specializations that you get to choose really customize the degree to your professional aspirations. So keeping that in mind moving forward, our specializations are really what allow you to hone in your degree, makes the degree very flexible for you so that you can kind of construct it and tailor it, again, around your professional aspirations, or if you want to go, let's say, a PhD route um, and really develop those um, academic interests. We also have seven graduate certificates that we offer. Um, the certificates are essentially minors or heightened specializations, so they take up a few more classes than the specialization would in the curriculum. One of the nice things about our certificates, they're both very helpful if, you're, if it's something that is of interest to you, but it's also not required. Um, so again, I would stress just keeping in mind as we go through the presentation that certificates aren't required, but if this is something that you particularly find interesting or that you're keen on professionally to develop, these certificates are a great way to develop that knowledge and skill base that's going to be needed in a professional world. We also have dual degree and joint degree programs here with other schools at DU. Um, keep in mind that we have these three listed here, but DU also has a really cool flexible dual degree program. So beyond the three that we have listed here, it's also possible at the Joseph Corbell School to kind of construct your own flexible dual degree with another program. 
Some students have started doing that with the cybersecurity program, for example, here at DU. Um, so again, really getting at just how flexible our degree programs are, not just individually, but also with the dual degrees that you can construct yourself. And then finally, we do offer a PhD international studies for those of you who are looking at that option as well. I've listed our master's degrees up here on the screen. To keep it a little less cluttered, I didn't put all of the different requirements in terms of internships and language up on the screen because it just gets um, really cluttered. But keep in mind, again, that these programs are very broad and they're designed that way to give you that very big base that you need to kind of do well in the field. But then the specializations are what you get to use um, to tailor the program how you want to. And that, again, you can see how all these kind of play off one another, the interdisciplinary nature of our programs. Um, keeping in mind, the programs differentiate between requirements on um, internships and language requirements. Um, when you are applying to the Joseph Corbell School, there is no language requirement to be accepted, um, although that is obviously something that can help you in certain situations, depending on where you'd like to go in the field. Um, but for most of these programs, either an internship or a language requirement is required. Um, I believe only the international development and the international human rights programs require both an internship and require proficiency in a language upon graduation. So these are the six master's degrees that are offered here at the Corbell School. And on the next slide here, we have the seven graduate certificates that you can kind of append to one of the graduate degrees here. Um, so the ones listed on the screen here, you can see again how these also fit into those really five core issues that we've identified here for working professionals moving forward. Um, and so once again, these certificates are not required in order to graduate from the Corbell School, but these are really ways to develop a very um, robust skill set in one of these areas um, if it's something that you're particularly keen on and that fits your professional goals moving forward. So these are really the degrees and certificates that are offered here at the Corbell School, again, just want to emphasize how interdisciplinary they are, how holistic they're designed to be to give you a broad um, base really to develop a specialization off of. So just keeping that in mind. So the student experience here at Corbell, we do average about 22 per class. Um, we have a really small student to faculty ratio, which we feel is important because we like our students to get to know the faculty and vice versa. Um, the faculty are required to be there, so office hours are a requirement for all faculty at the Corbell School. Most faculty host office hours several days a week, so they're very available and flexible for the students. All of our courses are taught by faculty. There are no PhD students or others who are teaching, so all of our courses are taught either by former professionals in the field um, or those who have their PhD and are um, usually tenured. Um, and so our faculty, obviously, they have the background in the field experience, and then they're well educated on these issues as well. So um, again, we're really a kind of teaching focused institution. So the faculty that are here are really focused on the students um, while also doing their own research and everything that most students actually assist with, whether it's research, research assistantships or things like that. The Corbell School does operate on the quarter system, which is a little bit different than our colleagues around APSIA. So the quarter system is um, the fall, winter, spring, and summer. The summer quarter is not required in order to complete the programs. Um, some students do it to either finish early or for whatever personal reason with an internship or something like that. But the quarter system is pretty simple. There's 10 weeks of classes and then one week of final, which makes up for that 11 weeks there on the screen. And then the time slots that are listed there, the vast majority of the classes do occur between those nine and five slots. Um, so if you're dreading night classes, then there's not many between those 6 and 8.50 p.m. slots. Um, and then finally, we have 15 plus Corbell student organizations. Um, at the Corbell School, we really do emphasize that you interact and um, interact with these student organizations because as we say, your peers today are your colleagues tomorrow. So it's really important that you develop relationships um, with your fellow students because those are going to be the people that you're going to be going into the field with with those networking connections, whether for jobs or whatever it may be um, moving forward. So getting to know your peers and kind of getting that relationship built in student organizations is something that we really emphasize here at the Corbell School. Um, I would like to emphasize that our student organizations are, um, they do a great job of bringing in speakers. So there's a few organizations like the Organization for Security Students 
who actually do with the director of that student group, um, Dr. Lewis Griffith here. They will bring in speakers, for example. So they do do a lot of cool work like that, which gives students in those organizations a great networking opportunity um, because they get to meet with working professionals in the field and develop those relationships as they bring them in for talks and such. So a really great job that our student organizations do here. Um, one of the more common questions that we do get at the Corbell School is, um, we're located in Denver, Colorado, uh, not a hub of international affairs. So how is such a highly ranked and accredited international school um, here in Denver? Well, one of the ways that we do that is we do connect our students back to those hubs through study abroad programs, internships, and professional opportunities. So the studying and interning in DC, Geneva, and Vienna are our three study abroad opportunities. And in Denver, Colorado, we do count studying in DC as abroad for our purposes. Um, but these three programs are ways that we really connect students into those hubs of international affairs where students go and they take classes. They also perform internships in those. And all that coursework easily applies to your degree program because most of our study abroad programs are run in conjunction with other APSIA, APSIA schools. So the credit transfer from the classes are very easy. And in addition, you also get to perform internships, which gives you a tremendous opportunity for networking in these areas, um, as well as that professional experience that's just so, so important. Um, for professional programs for the students moving on. So these are some ways really where we literally connect you with these hubs of international affairs. If you would like to be in one of these areas post-graduation, we do a really good job of keeping students connected to those hubs, um, both with classwork and in internships. Another reason that um, Corbell does so well, I feel, is our Office of Career and Professional Development. Now, these are the folks who really help you with internship hunts and job and job hunts. Um, they do individual coaching sessions for whatever it may be, formal interview practice, for example, with the Department of State or another agency or organization. Um, they also have tailored programming workshops to help you. Let's say you want to apply for a Fulbright. Um, they'll sit down with you and help you think about how to construct your essays for that. So they do a really good job preparing students not only for internship or job hunts, but they're also doing that extra step of really preparing you to stand out as a tremendous candidate in the eyes of those different employers. Um, they also had um, a plethora of online resources. One of the greatest ones that they have actually is a job and internship posting where they keep about six to have 700 postings at all times. The great thing about this, I feel, is that you can really use this as kind of a platform to jump into even more opportunities. So you look at all the listings that they have, and then you can kind of play almost the Wikipedia game where you start following links and kind of have a bottomless trail of jobs and internships that you can find off of that. So a really great job that our folks downstairs do, just helping connect students with different resources. Um, and they also have targeted employer networking events. So they'll bring in any of the three letter agencies and other organizations from around the world to Denver um, to basically network with students. So they bring them here to Denver. And that's one of, again, the really nice ways that Denver connects students to those hubs of international affairs is that we bring folks to Denver um, in order to network with you, connect with you. Um, and so they do a great job of that as well. And then finally, they do have um, shorter networking trips, such as the DC networking trip, where they take you to Washington, DC for the first week of December. And this is just a networking tour where you get to meet with, um, you know, I think it's about 20 to 25 different organizations in the DC area, anything from think tanks to nonprofits and the government agencies. So they really kind of give you a broad base there. Um, but these are the different ways that our Office of Career and Professional Development not only helps develop you um, and help prepare you for the professional world after graduation, but also brings those agencies and organizations that you may be, that you may desire to work for to Denver um, to network with you. Um, so just some career, uh, career outcomes here um, to give you a little pie chart of where students typically go after graduation. Um, and then as well as our 95% job placement rate, a number that we're really proud of here at the Corbell School. Um, the job internship posting that I mentioned there on the left, as well as the high number of awardees for competitive fellowships like those Fulbright um, Presidential Management Fellowships. We had four of those awarded last year alone, which is a tremendous number given our student body population. Um, but this really just gives you the breakdown by sector of where our students have gone on to work um, and intern. Um, as for Denver itself, Carmen mentioned, and one of the things considering for grad school is the living location. Um, in Denver, I've got to say, in terms of 
you know, we, there's a lot of great places in the Absia family, but Denver is definitely up there as one of the best to live. Um, an urban setting based right at the, um, the ridge of the Rocky Mountains here. Um, it's really hard to beat the, the lifestyle that we have here. Um, within six to eight hours of us, we have over a dozen different, you know, mountain resorts, state, national parks, things like that. So there really is, it's a wonderland of opportunity for anyone. And the best is that it really does kind of have that best of both worlds where you do have an urban center like Denver, but then you can drive an hour and you're in the middle of the, in the mountain wilderness, um, you know, skiing or backpacking, whatever it is you may like to do. So it really is kind of one of the best living locations for going to graduate school. Um, and so when you're going through, you know, that arduous process in grad school with the papers and the finals and such, it's nice to be in a location like Denver where there is an escape so close to you um, that kind of takes you out of the world of Corbell or, you know, your academic setting and into an entirely different place to let you recharge and reset. Um, and then some just listings there about Denver that we have on the screen, um, especially the largest number, one of the largest number of federal employees working here. Um, so students who come to Denver thinking about maybe DC or one of those locations um, sometimes end up staying in Denver because they find opportunities to work for, say, the FBI or one of those other um, government agencies here in the Denver area. So a really great location for grad school, um, hard to beat, really, and just a phenomenal place to spend, I think, um, about a year and a half to two years of your life. Um, and so that is about all I have for you on the Joseph Corbell front. Um, if there's any questions that you have, I'm sure we can answer them now. Thanks, Kevin. So the floor is now for all of you. Are there things that you've been wondering about or as you've put together perhaps an application you've been struggling with? And while you type, uh, I will take the, the opportunity to again invite you to join us at a grad school fair, but to also let you know about many of the online resources that we have and we publish through our different social media channels a ton of internships and jobs and fellowships. We tell different students' stories. So I invite you to join us on those different channels as well as at our recruitment events. You can see my email there on the slide as well if you'd like to follow up with any other questions. And I'm happy to connect you with Kevin if you send me an email as well. Yes, uh, Grace, there will be an option to view a recording of this webinar once it's completed. I'm also happy to share the slides with you. You will find us on YouTube and you'll find the presentation on YouTube at youtube.com slash apsiatube. And you'll see that link in the materials that we'll send out after this webinar. But I'm pleased to say that we will live into perpetuity uh, on the depths of the internet. <laughs> so it's fine if you didn't have a chance to, to take furious notes as well. See a few other people typing. So Kevin, I wanted to ask, I, I went quickly through the question of letters of recommendation. Are there particular pieces of advice you give to students who might be trying to figure out who they should ask to write a letter of rec? Yeah, absolutely, Carmen. So one of the most important aspects for the application process in general, but also for those letters of recommendation is that um, the application, the committee is trying to get a holistic and complete profile of the student. So for the letters of recommendation, we always stress the students that when you're trying to choose those recommenders, always find people who can speak to specific qualities about you um, that are related to the school, um, how you'll perform academically, but also that the committee can't find in your personal statement, your transcripts, things like that. So speaking to those you know, non-tangible qualities that the committee would like to hear to learn about the applicant and who they are that they can't find in transcripts or those other application materials, I think is probably the most important thing to consider for the letters of recommendation. So it's not just about finding the most famous person you know and getting them to write a few sentences on your behalf? Yeah, no, not at all, because you can get <laughs> the most famous person in the world, but if they can't say anything about you that really stands out for the committee and gives them an idea of what type of candidate they're gonna receive in the letter of recommendation doesn't carry that much quality to it. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about the different qualities of students and, and one of our, our colleagues here wonders, what qualities have you seen in folks that were most successful in navigating the application and the acceptance process? So the qualities of those folks. Um, 
patience is a big one, um, especially when you finish the, the when you submit the application. Um, you know, the six weeks I know can be a grueling process. Um, I remember it was for me, that's for sure. Um, but also diligence, like you mentioned, Carmen, those students who follow the application to um, to the letter. Um, we do. It happens so much. Students don't submit the correct materials or too many or too less or too few, I should say. Um, so patience, diligence, um, but also passionate. I feel passionate is a very good quality for those students because that can really come through in a letter of recommendation or a personal statement. Um, and those are things I think those are really the big three patience, diligence and passion are three qualities of students who do really well in the application process. The, if I may, the one I would add to that is clarity. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you have to know exactly what you want to do, but you should apply to schools for a reason. So if you have difficulty articulating why that particular school or why a graduate program now, taking a few minutes to, or time to do that important reflection can really be important because the, the school can tell when you're just throwing stuff up at the wall to see what sticks compared to a student who really has thought about why they want to apply to that program or that school or that field and sees it as part of a longer part of the journey. So we, <laughs> our next question, uh, one of our colleagues went back to school at the age of 24. So they have 10 years of work experience in different sectors, but graduated less than two years ago. Would you recommend all academic references for her or both academic and professional? Um, so the answer there is, um, it honestly depends. So, um, obviously one academic and one professional, um, would be perfect. Two academic references would be great as well. What it really comes down to for you, Grace, is which of those recommenders are going to be able to highlight specific qualities about you that you want the admissions committee to glean. So, um, whoever you think would be able to speak to something about you is I reckon is who I would say you should seek out for those letters of recommendation. Um, technically on our website, I think we do say if you can, one professional, one academic, because they usually provide different lenses um, for the committee to kind of get to know you. Um, but what it really comes down to is who is going to be able to say things about you that are going to connect best with the committee and what they're looking for in applicants and what best those recommenders can highlight about you. And to, to underscore something Kevin said, follow directions. So if a school gives you the option, take it. If the school gives you very specific guidance, do what they told you. So some of our colleagues are going to very specifically say one academic and one professional. Some of them are going to leave the question open and some of them are, are going to, to give you somewhere in between. So just at a base minimum, follow directions for all that is good in the world um, and you'll be okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Other key things that you all would like to know or you're struggling with um, or you're wondering about, rumors are powerful. So Grant asks, uh, does an academic recommender need to be a professor you had a course with or could it be someone else, an advisor or a professor you did research with, et cetera? Um, absolutely, it could be someone else. So in, as, as I've been saying, an advisor and a professor you did research with could actually speak to like skills or personality traits about you that the committee is not going to find in the transcripts. A lot of students, I think, make the mistake of getting a professor who they got a lot of A's with in undergrad or something like that. Um, and that recommender says, yeah, they were in my cl class, they did great, they got great grades. Um, and it just kind of reiterates what the transcripts say. So absolutely, it could be someone else, because um, specifically some of those people, especially the ones that are listed there, could speak to qualities that the committee is not going to find in a transcript. Are there particular things with a, an academic letter of recommendation that you think the committee finds useful to see? Yeah, I would say specifically, um, you know, to Grant's question, um, professors you did research with, for example, um, getting to know the work ethic of students, um, you know, getting great grades is, is a great first step. Um, but then the committee behind that wants to know what are the qualities about you that got you there. So um, when it comes to those academic letters, um, if you can find someone who can speak to, you know, as an advisor who was on the thesis project with you and they can speak to kind of all the different research that you did on that, 
or a professor on a research project who can speak to the different skills that you brought to the team. You know, if they were writing a book or if they were a, qual a, a quantitative driven project and kind of the different skills you brought there with like Python or something like that. Um, those are the things that are really stand out because it gives the committee a sense of the work ethic and the capabilities that the student brings to the classroom. The one addendum I would, I would also contribute might be if you have a faculty member who thinks that you ask really good questions mm -hmm. or has really engaged with the material in a, in a good, complete way, that's also a trait that I've seen be drawn out well in an academic letter of recommendation. Because a lot of what you're going to experience in class is not about necessarily the right answer, 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's really about how you engage with the subject, how you think about it complexly, Really for a field like ours that's so interdisciplinary and so interconnected, if you have someone that you've really been able to ask good questions to or with, um, that can be a great, great thing to hear in a letter. I see a few people typing, so I wanted to give one other bit of advice. Um, for those of you who've maybe been out of school for a couple years, if you're worried about that academic letter of recommendation, one good thing might be to try to reconnect with a faculty member now. Uh, if the, even if the deadline is in January, so to start to rebuild that relationship and, and warm it back up so that they can talk more about who you are and, and what you've got to. And if you're still in school, be sure you find a few people in the academic space that you can keep in touch with so that in a couple years when you're ready to apply, you'll continue to have that relationship. And it doesn't have to be every week. It could easily be every six months or once a year, just some check-in so that the relationship stays warm. <clears throat> and we had a question about the PhD program at Corbell. Um, is it designed for those who wanna go into academia or does it have the flexibility to be an applied doctorate? And where do PhDs typically end up? So for our PhD program, most are going into academia. Um, if you look at the two biggest um, subjects for our PhD program, um, it's international studies, which is essentially theory, and then international political economy. So you can kind of get a sense from those two alone that it really is more um, academic. Most of our PH students are looking to be going that tenured faculty track. Um, in terms of the applied doctorate off the top of my head, um, I'm not sure of any students in the last two or three years since I've been here who have used the degree in that sense. So most are going the academic route. Uh, and then where most typically end up, um, nowhere specifically, there's not a funnel that we go to, but like I said, since most are going in academia, they're tending to go that university track. So most of ours are going off and teaching um, in some capacity. For some of our other schools, PhD graduates in the non-academic space might end up at think tanks, places like the Congressional Research Service. Some may end up on the Hill. Some may end up with corporations or, or political analysis firms, political risk firms. It, there's a broad spectrum of institutions that really value the depth of research components, study and dealing with information that a PhD can provide. Um, so for the, the non-academic space in APSIA broadly, that's, that's often where folks might end up. But I, I know too many people who think they have to get the PhD to get let's say a job at the Congressional Research, well, CRS is a bad example, a job on the Hill, um, and that that isn't commonly true. Um, so it's it's a vocation, I'm told. Not one I have, but it's a vocation from what I understand, much like, I don't know, the priesthood, to, to go the PhD route. So we have a few minutes left. So if there's any other questions that you all would like to, to ask, whether it's specifically about our good friends at Corbell or something about the application process broadly, please let us know. We're here uh, to be of service to you whenever we can, and we do hope that you will uh, find good ways to take advantage of the tools and resources that we've made available on our website. All of it's free and there and available for you. So please uh, stay in touch with us as you continue your own discernment, and we hope you will welcome you to the APSIA family at some point in the near future. But we do still have a few more minutes if folks have burning questions. Um, but if you're not comfortable in this medium, you can also reach out by email or through any of our social media channels. And we'll be happy to, to answer whatever we can in that way. 
All right, seeing no one typing, I think we'll wrap up. But I want to thank all of you, and in particular, I want to thank Kevin for sharing all of his wisdom about the Corbell School with you, and not just uh, the accessibility to the Rocky Mountains and <laughs> the, the great backpacking and, and beauty of Denver. But I hope that you all found this useful, and please stay in touch. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks.